2010, I found myself laying under a magnificent big leaf maple tree in a very remote area of Vancouver, BC. I was dying. Now, there was no way this was supposed to happen to me. I was really healthy. My grandma lived to be 104. Her dad lived to be 106. I had these crazy genes. And I had this full expectation that I'd be living a long and healthy life. But as many of us know here, there's a veil between life and death, and that veil is very thin. And sometimes, for whatever reason, it's our time to step up to that veil, whether we're ready for it or not. I'm really happy to say that I received three profound understandings, truths, from that experience that dramatically changed my life. There's one in particular that they spent a lot of time, time trying to get into my noggin, and that's the one I'm going to be talking mostly about with you today, because after I learned what that was and assimilated into, in, into my life, it changed the whole trajectory of my life. And I'm also going to touch on a second one that was deeply profound in a very different way. But my story doesn't start at my near-death experience. It starts some time earlier. Um, who here has heard of the band Pearl Jam? Excellent. So I was in a band with the guitar player for Pearl Jam, Stone Gossard. And we were on tour. And one night, while I was performing with this band on stage in Brooklyn, a really bizarre thing happened. I was, we were, every, you know, everything's going fine. It was a nice big auditorium, having a great time. When all of a sudden, I looked, and there was this dude in the front row who was like this. Big, you know, baseball cap back, huge guy, and he's just like not having it, not into what we're doing. My first thought was, what's wrong with that guy? Why is he in the front row if he's hating this so much? That quickly changed to, hmm, huh, what's wrong with us? We might be playing really badly tonight. We have a different lineup. Must be sounding really bad. And very quickly, that changed to, what's wrong with me? I, oh, I must be singing horribly. Maybe I can't hear myself in the monitors. That means I'm singing off key. Oh, I hate that when that happens. Here comes this this high note that always freaks me out. I can, I'm very scared. I don't know if I'm going to hit it. Why did Stone even invite me to sing with him? I can't even sing. What am I doing up here? You know, it just went spiraling. And it felt like I tuned into this radio station of Barbara's negative thoughts. This station that, you know, we all hear some of our thoughts about ourselves and about the world. But this was a nonstop stream of these thoughts. So the weirdest thing was going on. There was part of my brain that was focused on singing, dancing, cueing with the band, remembering lyrics. There was another part of my brain completely engaged with this bizarre radio station of negative thoughts and looking at that guy all the time. And there was a third part of my brain that was standing back here the neutral observer going, wow, Barbara, look at you doing all this all at once. That's very fascinating. And a, a quick side note, there was some fan that night that sent us some photos later. And there's these two photos that were really funny later to me. They're the same exact angle of Stone and me on stage. And in the first one, I'm going, and in the second one, I'm going, looking at the dude. And that was a really good example of what my brain was doing. So that night, I, I got in my bed and I thought, what on earth was that about? And am I having negative thoughts like this all the time and I'm just not aware of them? Well, I was to find out the answer to that, but not in the way I ever would have expected. As I was lying there, I thought, you know, I've had therapy, I've done this, I've done that. 
And I thought I kind of got rid of all these negative thoughts, but apparently they are fully in bloom in my life. So what is going to kick them out if all these other techniques didn't? I sat there thinking, I thought, oh, I've got a great idea. I'm going to sign up for one of those camps where you go and you, you every day you do scary things and you push your boundaries and you're going to develop all this courage. That's going to kick those things right out. So I, I looked online. I found this camp. It wasn't starting for a while, but I said, oh, I can handle it. It'll be okay. Well, time passes. Now it's time to go to this camp. And I, my friend Michelle, my best friend, came with me. And I'm really grateful she did, as it was to turn out. So we're, we're walking up to this place, super remote, took all these different types of transportation to get there. We're going up there with our suitcases and our tents. So it was a week-long camp. And before we even go to set up our tent, they say, oh, no, you have to sign this form. I'm like, what is this? Oh, it's a liability form. And it was crazy. It was like, if you get eaten by wolves and fall off a cliff and lose your right arm or you die, it's not our problem. And we're like, uh, okay, if we sign. And then we're leaving, they go, oh, no, wait, you have another form. I'm like, what's this? It's a non-disclosure form, so I can't tell you what we did in this camp. But I can tell you, it was a week long, and it was scary as hell. And every day I woke up going, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? And it was super physically intense. I ate mounds of food at every meal, and I still lost weight. I was sweating like crazy. We got a, I got a five-minute shower in there, so thank God I brought my deodorant. Um, it was very intense. And yes, I did develop a ton of courage. I did all sorts of things I never possibly thought I could do. And then the last day was an endurance experience involving bricks. That's all I'll say. And it was a beautiful sunny day. And um, I had my water. I didn't want to be dehydrated. And so we're teamed up. So I have this delightful young woman from Mexico City as my teammate. And we start off on this thing. Everything's going fine. Yeah, I'm tired, but I'm doing it. We get halfway, have a little bite, we're coming back, and something weird started happening. First, my legs got really wobbly. Everything was just kind of shaking. This is odd. I must be tired or dehydrated. I better drink more water. And then I started seeing these flashes of light everywhere. What is that? And kind of like auras around things, just really psychedelic kind of sensory experiences. Then this delightful girl with me, when she would talk to me, her words were all warbled. And she said, Barbara, I was in the water and you'd see them. The sun just, and not. I was like, I didn't know what she was saying, but I didn't want to freak her out or freak me, me out more by saying, I don't know what you're saying. So I just kind of nodded, kept going. And at the same time, I could hear conversations with clarity that were really far away. So I didn't know what was happening. Well, I made it to the end, which blew my mind that I could do it. But I did. And the only thing is, at the very end, I realized, wow, something is wrong. Because as I'm coming up to the finish line, there's people on either side of us cheering us on. And as I'm, I'm running through... They were all, it was like a, a horror movie. They were all strobing like this and going, everything's reverbing and everyone looks weird and there's flashes of light. The whole sensory explosion was wrong. It was not a happy feeling. And I sat down and I, I, I thought, God, I'm going to faint. And I saw some guy I'd, I'd talked to earlier and, and I said, Hey, will you go get a medic? I think I'm going to faint. He goes, huh? Oh, okay. He goes, sorry, off, no big deal. And I'm like, hurry, you know, I'm thinking, well, minutes pass. I don't know, it took maybe 15 minutes. He finally saunters up and he goes, oh, they said you'll be fine. Just rest here. I'm like, oh, my God. So eventually I, I had some people help me get back to the main camp, and I started asking for a medic. Well, this guy shows up, 
sweetheart guy, but he was no medic. I think he had maybe a three-hour CPR training. And he took one look at me, and he looked more scared than I did. And he, he did do tests, you know, blood pressure and this kind of thing. And with every test, he was getting more, his eyes were just getting bigger and bigger and not knowing what to do. And so I'm laying there. He did give me electrolytes, which I think is what, on a physical level, saved my life. My friend, meanwhile, Michelle, comes up. She goes, oh, I've been looking for you everywhere. What is wrong? She said later, my skin was this ashen color. And I had these dark circles under my eyes, and my eyes were completely vacant. I was not present. And she knew something was desperately wrong. So they decided to bring me back to my tent and have me lie down for a while. Because no one th thought I was dying. I sure didn't think I was dying. I just knew something was wrong. So it's too hot in the tent, so they lay me under this beautiful, big leaf maple tree. And while I'm lying there, the guy takes off. He said he'll, he'll come back and check in on me. My friend's holding my hand, praying, doing Reiki on me. And suddenly I go into a panic because my left leg is draining of any kind of presence or energy. It's going numb. It's disappearing. And I start screaming, Michelle, my leg. What's, what's wrong, Barbara? It's, it's disappearing. I can't feel it. And then my right leg and then my left arm, and then my right arm. And now all I could tell of myself was a torso and a head. That was my existence. And I am scared. And at that moment, I started feeling the weirdest sensation of my life energy starting to flow out the top of my head. And I said, oh boy, I am in big, big trouble. Right at that moment, a movie started playing in my head that was crystal clear, not like a memory that's a little bit foggy. It had sounds, and I had all, I could feel all the emotions that I had of this movie that was something that happened two weeks prior in my life when I was at a band rehearsal with my brother, and it hadn't been going well. And the movie's playing, and then it freeze frames, and this voice appears in my head, not my normal internal voice, not a voice from outside, this calm, neutral, kind of male voice, and it said, what were you thinking at that moment? And I thought, I told him what I was thinking, and the movie went off the screen. A new movie took its place of something that had happened maybe a month earlier. It freeze-framed. Again, I was asked, what were you thinking? The next one that came up, it, when it freeze-framed, they said, what did that gesture mean when you turned your head down at that moment? Another one was, what did it mean when you raised your eyebrow at that moment? Each of these went over and over for four hours. Four hours of this. I used to call it a life review, and now I'm thinking it's so different from traditional NDE life reviews. I think it is a, what I call a mind review or a thought review. So this went on and on and on. I became, became really engrossed in it and way less afraid of what was going on with my body. But meanwhile, that life energy was still going out of the top of my head. At the end of it, the voice said, OK, Barbara, now it's your time to tell us, would you like to stay or go? Stay in my body, go back to my life, or go to this thing that I was right on the edge of. It was almost like a curtain that I could peer through, and I could feel what was on the other side. And it's like what everyone has described here, this incredible sense of peace and love, like arms that just, the arms you always wanted to hold you were are waiting. And I thought, wow, that looks really great over there. But I don't know if I'm finished here. So I had questions of my own to ask that voice. And I'll get back to those a little later in the talk. I did make the choice to come back. At the moment I made that choice, I could feel all the life energy shooting back into my head. I could feel each limb coming back to life very quickly, like within just a few minutes. And I was back. I opened my eyes. 
The sun by then had gotten really low, and it was this incredibly beautiful orange hue everywhere. This, the back of my friend's auburn hair was glistening and lit up by that, by that color. I saw the most beautiful big old bumblebee buzzing around, the most beautiful flower I'd ever seen. I was like, oh my God, I'm alive. For the next month, oh my gosh, for a month, it was like I was on heaven on earth. Because it, it really felt like I'd been through a rebirth. Everything that I felt and tasted and heard was so extraordinarily beautiful. It was absurd. I would smell every flower that I passed on the street. And I could hear music not just through my ears, but even through my feet. I tasted foods like I'd never tasted them before. It was like the state of presence had walked in through my front door. Because here I was alive, alive. I could see things. I could dance. I could breathe the fresh air. I could have a bad dream and not even care. And that happened to me. You know how you wake up from a dream and you're like, oh, no, it's coloring my whole day, this bad color. I started down that road when I had my bad dream and went, oh, wait a minute. This is so great. I have a bad dream. It means I'm alive. And I love life. And I love my five senses. So this incredible state lasted for a month. And then I started eating while I was working. Music started playing in the background. I started smelling maybe one flower a block. And worst of all, self-doubt started to come back. Self-criticism started to come back. And worry, which was my personal kryptonite, started coming back. I was a big worrier about someone in my life that I care deeply about, whose life wasn't going the way I thought it should be going. So I was worried for him all the time. And I, that became the turning point, because I sat down and I said, OK, what was the common denominator of all those questions that voice asked me during that life review or mind review? And I realized they were all about my thoughts, my negative thoughts. And I realized if I could change that pattern of thinking, perhaps my life would be completely different. And that's exactly what happened. Because even though I was doing a cool job singing with a great person, I was also going through a divorce. I was not making enough money to pay my bills. My energy wasn't the way, the, the way I wanted it to be. And I had been on antidepressants for years and was at that moment. And so my idea of what happiness was, was limited as I was to find out later. So I embarked on an exploration of the mind, basically. I strapped on my virtual headlamp and got my map and compass out, and I delved into all the research I could find about thought and negative thought from the aspect of neuroscience, from a layperson's um, angle aspect, from cellular biology and how we become addicted to the chemicals of negative emotions that we think we don't want. But there's, our cells are like baby birds going, I want shame and anger and guilt. And so we keep feeding it. And I, of course, read the spiritual text to see what they had to say about negative thinking. What I found out is there are two types of negative thoughts. The one negative thought is the normal type, the regular everyday one that goes in your head and then it leaves. And then there's a second type of negative thought that hooks in. And it is like a loop that keeps going over and over like a hamster on a wheel. And an example of these are the, the first one might be before you go to, to work and you spill all this coffee all over yourself. And you're like, oh, darn it. And you get mad for a second, you clean your shirt, and you go out the door. You're not thinking about it anymore. It's done. And then the mind loop type 
You spill the coffee on yourself, and it becomes a contagion for all sorts of negative thoughts and in yourself and later with other people. So I would, might maybe would say, darn it, I can't believe I did that. I'm so clumsy. And then I'll start thinking all the clumsy things I've done throughout my life. Remembering how someone, maybe a parent, has said to you that how clumsy you are and going through all that. And the, how could they have said that to me? Well, maybe I am and going on all that. And now I have to get a whole new shirt. And how come I haven't gotten a raise from my work? Because I don't want to buy a new shirt for work. And then on and on and on and on. You get to the work, and then it's you telling everyone, oh, you won't believe what happened to me today. I spilled all this coffee. And then, that, then they're thinking, yeah, I'm clumsy too. And then they're off and running in their own loops. It's a horrible virus. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, my goodness. I think all those scenes that I was seeing in my review were instances where I had been looping on the thought and not taking care of myself, not putting up the right boundaries, all sorts of things. So I went back into my research and I said, okay, how do I stop these things? And I tried all these different techniques out. I made myself the guinea pig, came up with some other things, synthesized a lot of things, and I came up with what I call the de-looping method, stopping those loops. And as I worked on this, on de-looping myself, my whole life started transforming. My relationships improved dramatically. Money started flowing into my life. I look very different. If you saw a picture of me before all this, you'd say, wow, she has changed dramatically. And I got off antidepressants, which, and I have nothing against them, by the way. I think they're lifesavers but I didn't want to be on them for the rest of my life. So I found another way to center myself, and that's been great. So the whole process of this de-looping, it, it, well, Gandhi said, a man is but a product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes. And I thought, what does that mean? If I think something, I become that. What is that? And there's a cycle, this what I call the mind loop cycle. It's a very dangerous cycle. It starts with a thought, like, let's say you have a job interview coming up, and you say to yourself, oh, I'm terrible at job interviews. I always freeze up at them. I can't stand them. And so now that thought leads to an emotion, which is anxiety, fear, wanting to procrastinate on that, not interested in it. Well, maybe I shouldn't even go for that job. Maybe I don't really want that job, even though I was excited about it until I thought about the interview. And then that leads, the emotion leads to an action, a behavior, an inaction. So that could be procrastinating. It could be um, any of the addictions. It might mean that person doesn't get their resume done on time or do the preparation. So what the action then leads to a reinforcement of the thought, because imagine if this person is so anxious and hates this thing, so the night before, they go out and drink a bunch of shots of tequila to calm themselves down. Now they go to their job interview hungover, unprepared, anxious, and they probably aren't going to get the job. So it's this cycle of what we think that starts with that thought. It's who, what we become. So the whole de-looping piece is finding entry points in any of those areas, in the thought or in the emotion or in the behavior, where you can redirect yourself and think something different, feel something different, do something different to change that outcome. The, the, the method is... is comprised of three different parts. The, one, the first part's all about the thoughts, de-looping negative thoughts. The second part is about cleaning out the emotions that get stored in the body. And the third part is about retraining the mind and the actions so that you, you, this whole pattern doesn't even start. So I want to quickly cover these different pieces and then tell you about the other gift I got. So... Um, 
This whole first section is based on neuroscience and how the mind works with the way it, it does the processing of um, repetitive thoughts. And the, the way it was, I was able to unhook it is by looking at, okay, we have, we have this brain, and with neuro, <coughs> excuse me, self-directed neuroplasticity, it tells us that this brain is plastic, it's moldable. We have actually some kind of power in directing the way we think. And so I think of it like, any hikers in this room? I'm a huge hiker. <laughs> so if you go, say you're going up to your favorite hiking path, and you're about to start it, and you look over in this, there's this beautiful area of woods over there that has no path. You think, well, maybe I'll explore that one today. And you start going in there, you're bushwhacking, you're removing the cobwebs, and you're, you, you make your way to this beautiful area of wildflowers. And you think, that's beautiful, I'm going to come back here tomorrow. So you find your tiny little trail, and you retrace your steps. The next day you come back, you can kind of see where you started. You go down that trail again, and you keep checking out that new trail. Well, as you're going down this new trail, what's happening to the original hiking trail? It's getting overgrown. The log may have fallen down that no one moves because no one's taking this thing anymore. And that was the same that that's the same thing that goes on with our neural pathways in our brain. When we have a loop, and we've been doing this for a long time, it gets really well entrenched and lit up, and it's so easy to go there because it's clear. It's something we've gone before. And that could be a negative thought we have about ourselves or about the world. So the whole process is not going down that loop, not going down that trail, finding this other trail to start going down and start making that one really, really clear. So the first step is detect, detecting when we're having a negative thought. And Carl Jung said, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our lives and we will call it fate. And so many of these loops are unconscious. So the, we can't do anything about the thought if we don't even know they're, they're happening. So we become really aware and conscious of what we're thinking, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. The next piece is to detach from the thought, because if you think about it, our thoughts become who we are. They, it, they become our identity. And, and if we're fused with this thought, how could we change it? So you, we detach from the thought, and I can be me, and my thought can be over here, and I could recognize it as just a thought. It doesn't have to be a true reality. And there's different ways to detach, but one of the easiest ways is to get into our body because we're all our energy is up in our mind. So one of my, the techniques in my book is my left foot, I call it. it, can be any part of your body, but to just start focusing on your left foot for like a minute, feeling it. What's the temperature? Are the to toes touching each other? What, is, uh, what does it feel from the inside? If you can detect blood vessels. And when, that, when we start doing that, some of the energy that's all in this looping mind starts going down into the foot to activate it. And it calms, it calms the whole process down. You start detaching from a thought. The third one is detouring, making a conscious decision to change the direction of what you are thinking about. So you think, you, you figure out you're, you're having this negative thought, you detach, and then you go, okay, I will start thinking about something else consciously. And there's a whole lot of different things you can think about and do. It's really about doing different things, get your mind off it. And the fourth one is de-story. And if you think about if there, there's not, the, the only thing that you really need to keep a worry or a problem going is a story about yourself or the other person and their motivations. And if, if we look back at history and look at these beliefs that were super entrenched, like that the earth was flat and that ships would fall off the cliff and 
get eaten by dragons that were in the oceans. And there's all sorts of crazy things like that that we not only believe, but we believe so intensely that some people lost their lives trying to explain, I think the world might be round. So if that's the case with history, do you think some of our own thoughts, our beliefs might not be right? Maybe the reason John didn't text me last night isn't because he hates me or I did something wrong or he's mad at me, but maybe he was busy or forgot or lost his phone or any other possible story. So that segment is just taking the story out, checking out situations, and, and if there's a more positive story you could be telling yourself, then great, tell it, because we don't know. So that's the whole first segment. The second piece is, like I said, about the body and where we store our emotions are all in our body. And even though I call them negative emotions, I don't believe any emotions are negative. I believe they're like a GPS system that are telling us, are we going in the direction we want to be going in? If we're not happy in a relationship, and we're always upset and anxious and our self-esteem's crashing, that our emotions are telling us, hey, do you want to be in this relationship? Or do you think maybe you guys can work on something here? Same with a job or anything. So uh, I love my emotions. The only thing is, you know, there's a lot of things we don't feel like feeling. And so we deny them, we push them away, we pretend they don't exist. But we all know they don't just disappear. <laughs> they like to hang out. They want to be heard. They want to be uh, understood. And so you may have read that book, A Stroke of Insight, My Stroke of Insight by Jill Bolte Taylor. And she says it takes 90 seconds for an emotion to move through the body. 90 seconds? And I've been holding on to this emotion for two decades? Like, that is crazy. So I started really, when an emotion comes in, I stop if I can and, and find a moment to feel it. And it just, it feels like sensation in the body. You know, anxiety is usually in the stomach. Anger, your, your hands and your feet get all worked up because you're ready to punch or run. So there's different parts of the body that reflect these emotions, and when we feel them, they have a chance to move through, and we, are get, we start cleaning out all this stuff that's been playing in the body and, and causing bad feelings and often illnesses, too. Then the, net, the last phase of this is reprogramming the mind, retraining the mind, and doing different actions. And, you know, I heard... I heard that there was that one in a hundred people know what they want. One in a hundred people. And before my near-death experience, I was like, yeah, well, I am one of those hundred one in a hundred people. I know what I want. And my friend came over, the same friend that was with me at the near-death experience. And she said, oh, that's so great. I'm so glad you know what you want. So you want to do music. That is great. So uh, I guess you're going to be touring. You want to tour? I'm like, yeah, I think. She said, oh, good. So how many days, weeks, months, how much of the year? I'm like, uh, I don't know. I'll figure it out. Well, who do you want in your band? I'm like, well, it depends what music I want to do. And this went on and on. She just had all these normal questions. I didn't have any answers. I didn't know what I wanted at all. And if we, if we really think we're going to even ask the universe or even ask ourselves to co-create with us or to create this life that we really want. How is the universe or us or our friends or anyone or any of our loved ones supposed to help us if we don't even know what the heck we want? So the first step is dreaming. What do we want? The next step is deciding, making some decisions, seeing if these things are actually things that we want, you know, exploring them. And the last piece is doing, making some actions. So that was the, that's the whole de-looping method. And the first 
the first piece, the one about the thoughts, is all in my book, How to Stop Negative Thoughts. Pretty clear title. <laughs> and um, it has really dramatically, as I said, changed my life. Before I move on to the second one, I want to tell you a real quick story that happened a few days ago and how this plays out, this whole method plays out in my life, or at least the first four pieces, which I work a lot. So I'm coming home, and it was a pretty day. It was like four days ago, and I live in an apartment on Lake Washington. And so I got my keys out, and I was looking at the sky and the beautiful water, and I don't know how it happened. Whoosh! The keys fly over the banister into the freaking lake. And I'm like, no! You know? <laughs> and I'm looking down there, and it's deep, but I can still see the keys down there. That was my house key, my car key, all my keys. I am messed up now. And I, you know, I start, I started hearing these thoughts of, Oh, your day is completely wrecked now. This is going to take forever. That, that car key costs $500. You're going to have to pay $500. And on and on. And I was like, it started. And I went, oh, wait, hold on. I hear you. I detected. Then I did my detaching. I didn't use the left foot, but a different technique. And then I, I, I detoured my thought by thinking, OK, I'm going to get into problem-solving mode. How am I going to get these things? That'll distract me from all these negative things. It'll put me in some focus of what to do. So I started thinking about that. And then this piece about the story, how horrible this was, what a disaster. I thought, well, maybe something cool will come from it. Uh, who knows why this happened? This is really odd. And, and not allowing the story to attack me. So I, at first I texted the maintenance people. No one's in. No one knows when they're coming in. So I went, OK, let's see. i got to get down there off this dock. But it's really far down there. Maybe I'll get a stepladder. And so right then, this other friend of mine in the apartment building, wasn't. she took the day off from work. Who knew? And she comes strolling out. And she's like, how are you doing? I'm like, well, I'd be fine, except my keys are in the lake. She's like, what? So together, we got this step ladder, and we're inching it down. It's really far just to the w top of the water. So I'm, I'm leaning on the edge of the dock. I have it over my toe, and I'm leaning this thing down. And it's, you know, a bumpy floor of the lake, and the, there's rocks, and it's moving around. I'm trying to center it with my feet. And then, OK, we got it kind of OK. A power boat goes by, all these waves. Now the ladder's threatening to completely disappear, and I'm grabbing it with my foot. And I think, OK, I need something to hold on to. So I found a hose. And it was like we're mountaineers, and she's holding on to the, oh, tell me when you need more slack, you know? And so I'm, I'm coming, I'm creeping down the side of this dock into the water to touch the top of the, the ladder, and I'm holding on for dear life. And lo and behold, I start a laughing attack. <laughs> and I can't believe it. I'm hanging on going, ah, 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 just, this is the weirdest thing. And that triggered her, and she's trying to hold on, and she's you know, laughing. I got myself together. I get down there, and I crawl down the ladder, and I get water all over me, and of course. But I do get my keys. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> And then, of course, it was a whole ordeal getting back out, but I did get back out. We pulled the ladder back. And so that, you know, that, yeah, I told some friends later about this, and they said, I can't believe it. I would have been thinking, this was the worst day of my life, you know. And I could have gone down that road. I could have thought this was horrible. But it turns out it was one of the most hilarious experiences I've had recently. And I'm glad I get to tell you about it. So that's how it plays, this, this technique plays out just in normal everyday life. So I'm eternally grateful for that gift that I got in a near-death experience. Otherwise, who knows where my thinking could have taken me by now. So the second thing I want to briefly cover. How much time do I have, Debbie? Perfect. Okay, so remember I said at the 
at the end of all those movies I was watching during my near-death experience, that I was given the choice to stay or go. And I asked questions back to the voice. I said, well, that sounds, this feels so incredible on that side. I am very tempted to go there, but there's one thing. What about all my projects that are half done? I have albums ready to come out. What about my books and all these projects? And this was the most delightful dose of humility a person could get. It said, oh, Barbara, those projects, they aren't that important. I was like, really? It's like, no, what's really important are your relationships. Now, if your projects open uh, a relationship up between you and another person, or them and another person, or them with themselves, or me with myself, then yeah, they are important. But in general, that's not what counts. And what it was, what did count, according to our conversation, was how we show up in the world. How open are our hearts? How do we treat other people? Do we judge them, or are we open to them? How do we treat ourselves? Can we forgive ourselves for things? Can we love ourselves despite all these worthlessness loops that we might be go have going on in our head? And uh, so, sorry, just, I just got some other thoughts just popped in, and so I got a little distracted there. <laughs> So I, I thought, okay, it said, when you go back, if you choose to go back, you need to do four different things, or see four different people, and you need to tell them, several of them, you need to tell them how much you love them. And there are people who know I love them. My mom, for instance, she knows I love her, but it's like, it's not like, hey, man, I love you. It's not one of those, right? It's this is why I love you. These are the qualities about you that I love and that the impact you have made on my life. The depth of love, expressing that to these people. There was another person I needed to make amends to. And even if we think we're, they are 90% wrong in a situation, we are responsible for at least that 10%. And I need to look every day at every one of my interactions and find out what is my part in that. And do I need to make amends to them? Or do I need to make amends to myself? And so uh, I went back. I called these people. I made appointments that whole next week. And boy, I can tell you, they were intense. I was crying. They were so freaked out. They couldn't look at me because I was in the state of presence from the near-death experience and telling them all this deep stuff. And boy, did that open that bond, though, between me and them, and changed, really, how I moved through, the, through the, this life. And how I look at it now is, we, we are like a, if I, if, I, if I was a boat on the water and I was leaving a wake behind me, what kind of wake do I want to leave? You know, I don't want to be like, you know, uh, is it pig pen and the peanuts that's going walking around with all that dust and detritus hanging off them? Darling little guy. But I don't want to walk around with all this crud leaving behind me. I want to walk around and bring inspiration and joy and um, sunshine in whatever form it appears to as many people as I can. And so that's what, what I work on these days the de-looping, and how I'm showing up with an open heart. If you think about what life consists of, it's a string of little tiny, tiny, tiny moments, like a film with all the little frames that all together create this film. Our little moments all strung together create our life. And at any moment, we can choose something different different way of thinking, a different way of, of behaving towards another person or to ourselves. 
And so at each moment, I do my best to stay as present as I can and make these conscious choices. So I want to end by just thanking you so much for coming and hearing my story. I really appreciate it because it's my feeling that the more people de start delooping these negative thoughts, the happier they're going to be. I totally know that. And the happier a person is, the kinder they're going to be to other people. And the kinder that we are to other people, the happier they're going to be. And that actually gives us a chance to let the whole planet start lifting up. And I think, especially after hearing all the amazing people during this conference, I think that we may be heading towards a tipping point in consciousness where there's a focus on the heart and on connection and loving our own selves instead of this destruction and greed and me versus you that we see around us. At least that's my deep and profound hope. So thank you so much for being part of that tipping point and for Ions to invite me here and to be, play such a big role in that tipping point. Thank you so much.